chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read the first nine verses. 2 Corinthians 8, beginning at verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Now let's again pray to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to consider our Lord Jesus Christ and the great sacrifice that he has made for us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give to us your Holy Spirit, the one who comes and teaches us about Christ out of your word. Please, our God, may his ministry in our minds and souls today be powerful and effective, that we might rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might glory to have such a Savior, and that we might be thankful that he was willing to come and die and shed his precious blood for us. Please, our God, do a great work. We pray, our Father, that you would be strengthening faith, and where there is no faith, creating faith, giving it as a gift, that our Savior might be praised. We ask in his name, amen. amen. subject of 2 Corinthians 8 and chapter 9 is that of Christian giving. The Apostle Paul is seeking to stir up the Corinthian church to a great activity in giving. Now the specific concern that Paul is addressing here is an offering that had been announced to the churches for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Judea had been struck by a famine and so many Christians there were suffering. Uh, they were poor. They didn't have enough money to buy bread. And so Paul, among the churches where he had ministered, especially in the Gentile world, was encouraging them to gather up this offering and send it to Jerusalem. You find the Apostle Paul seeking to motivate the Corinthian church to active participation by setting examples before them. Corinth, as you know, was in the south. The Macedonian churches were in the north. And the offering had already been gathered there. And Paul said, those churches in Macedonia, even though they're very poor, they had given with such liberality. And he expected that their example would stir up the people in Corinth to giving. 
But then in verse 9, he sets before them an even greater example. It's the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Now here's the essence of this motivation that the apostle is setting before the Corinthian church. Christ is rich, but for your sake, he was willing to become poor in order to make you rich. That's the essence. Christ is rich, he was willing to become poor in order to make you rich. Now as we study through this chapter, we understand that the issue is much more than a matter of dollars and cents. Because really, this is a matter of the heart. Even here in verse 9, he introduces this motivating example by saying, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This grace that was in the Lord Jesus that he's describing here is an overflowing love that is completely undeserved. The Corinthian church, the Christians there, they didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. There's nobody in the world who deserves this overflowing love. But Christ so loved his people that though he was extremely wealthy, he was willing to become extremely poor in order to make us rich. Paul says, for you know this. In other words, you've had it preached to you. You've heard the gospel. You know the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he was willing to leave heaven and come down to this world in order to be our Savior. You know it. You've heard it. But I believe when he says you know it, he's also saying you've experienced this. It's not merely that you know the story of Christ or know the story of the gospel, but your lives have been impacted by this. Your lives have been changed and transformed by this. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a gospel motivation that should excite us to live for Christ no matter what the issue is, whether it's giving or any other area of Christian obedience. When we see what Christ has been willing to do for us, what is there that we would be unwilling to do for Christ? I want us to spend some time this morning thinking over this simple statement about our Lord Jesus. It's an excellent opportunity to remind us of who Christ is and what he has done for us. So, three simple questions this morning. First of all, what are the riches of Christ? What are the riches of Christ? Now, though the Apostle Paul is setting before us the example of our Lord Jesus in a financial context, He's talking about money. He's exhorting them to generous giving. These words that he uses to describe the Lord Jesus speak of much more than money. The apostle isn't simply saying Christ had a big bank account and he was willing to empty it to make you wealthy. This is an analogy. He's using something that we're very familiar with to speak of even greater things. So what are the riches of Christ? Well, Christ's riches are his deity, his Godhead, the fact that he possesses everything that makes God to be God. In learning about God, we speak of the attributes of God, the character of God. His holiness, his power, his wisdom, his love, his mercy, and so on. The riches of Christ reminds us that the Lord Jesus possessed 
all of these characteristics. The display of this character is often referred to as God's glory. In the Old Testament, it was a brilliant, shining light, a light brighter than the sun. You know how you tell your kids, don't look directly at the sun, it's too powerful for you? The glory of God is more powerful than the light of the sun. That was the light that traveled with them from Egypt to the promised land so that they would know that God is with us. That same glorious light was seen in our Lord Jesus Christ when in Matthew 17, he went up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration and he was changed, he was transformed so that his clothes began to shine and his face was a light brighter than the sun. This glory that was a few times manifested in the life of our Lord Jesus was referred to by Jesus himself as he looked forward to returning to heaven to be with his Father. In John 17, at the beginning of his high priestly prayer, he said this to his Father, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And so the Lord Jesus, looking forward to Calvary and the suffering and death he would experience there, was able to look beyond the cross to his victorious resurrection and then ascension into heaven where he would be exalted and crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. His glory would be on full display then as his Godhead was seen by all of the inhabitants of heaven. The writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament describes Jesus this way in chapter 1. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In words that we perhaps struggle to understand, the writer speaks of the glory of God, his character shining out from God, and he says that's Jesus, the radiance of the glory of God. This one who suffered and died, and following that, he's now seated at the right hand of his Father in glory in heaven. These are the riches of Christ. From all eternity, he had been at his Father's side. There he had enjoyed the blessed communion between the members of the Godhead, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. He had exercised all of the attributes of God, the love and peace and unity that reigned in their relationship. Here is a wealth that staggers the imagination. So in just a few minutes, I've spoken of the riches of Christ, but this has literally been just a scratching of the surface. Because if we would dig into our Bibles, we would discover things about our Lord Jesus Christ and his Godhood that would thrill us and give us more than we could ever spend time thinking on. These are the riches of Christ. Second question, what is the poverty of Christ? If the riches of Christ are his deity, his Godhood, the fact that he possesses in himself all of the characteristics of God, what is the poverty of Christ? Well, though Paul doesn't define it in this text right here, a survey of the scriptures helps us to understand that the poverty of Christ is the state of humiliation that he entered into when he came to this world to be our Savior. We're introduced to that state of humiliation 
in the Christmas story. The record of the birth of Jesus bears the marks of loneliness. God chose two people, Mary and Joseph, to be the human parents. Mary, who would bear the child as a virgin, Joseph, who would be the legal parent by adoption. They were not royalty or Hollywood star uh, type stars. They were simple, common people living in Nazareth, an out of the way, despised place. And even when they were forced to travel to Bethlehem by the Roman decree, they ended up in a barn where Jesus was more, uh, born and laid in a manger, an animal's feeding trough. Now, who today would think of giving birth to their baby in a barn or laying the baby in such a place? This was the Lord of glory, the exalted Son of God, who is willing to stoop so low. Many other gospel references point to this humiliation of the Lord Jesus. He had no home to call his home, nowhere to lay his head. Now, when you think of descriptions like that, who do you think of today? The homeless people that you see on the news? You know, people living on the sidewalk under a temporary shelter? If you've been to Toronto in the middle of winter, you see people huddled up in a sleeping bag, lying on the sidewalk in the, in the bitter cold. That was Jesus. No home. Nowhere to lay his hand. It was a position of great humiliation. At the heart of this humble state, this state of humiliation, was his obedience to his father. He was willing to become a servant. His father had given him a work to do. And he said, I will do it. I will be a servant. I will obey all that my father has given me to do. And when his father in his plan said, it's time to suffer and die, Jesus was willing to say, not my will, but your will be done. I'll go to the lowest rung on the ladder. I'll suffer, I'll die. I'll become a sin bearer for others. The Holy One of God was willing to be accounted a sinner, to take our guilt and our shame and our penalty. As was prophesied of him in Isaiah 53, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Jesus was willing to take on the poverty of deep humiliation. Now as we consider the riches of Christ and his poverty, there is a crucial theological truth that we must not miss or be confused about. Paul is not telling us that Christ was once rich, but he gave up all those riches to become poor. His words here are very clear. Jesus was and continues to be rich, even though he became poor. Now, in our minds, we can't understand that. And it's simply because we can't understand this truth. How can Jesus be both God and man at the same time? But that's what Paul is telling us here. And we must be very clear about it. He was and continues to be rich, even though he became poor. In other words, 
He didn't give up any of his riches. He didn't give up any of his deity when he became poor. He didn't cease to be God despite his great humiliation. Paul spells it out here very clearly. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That phrase, though he was rich, can be translated literally, being rich, he became poor. In other words, both conditions were his at the same time. He is rich. The verb is a present tense verb indicating an ongoing condition. He is rich. He continues to be rich, but he also became poor. Now, how did he do that? Well, he did it by veiling his Godhood, by putting his glory behind the veil of his humanity and not exercising at all times all of his attributes as God. For instance, he's in the wilderness, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan comes to him, if you're really the Son of God, command these stones to become bread and satisfy your hunger. He could have done that. At that very moment, he could have said to those stones, become bread, and he would have had a wonderful meal. But he refused to exercise the character of God, his great power, and continue in his feeling hungry as a man. So when you look at the baby in the manger in the gospel accounts, you see a helpless creature. You don't look at him and say, well, that must have been the person who made the world. You would have never guessed that that helpless baby was the creator of all things. And when you see a man hanging on the cross, you see what appears to be a helpless victim you don't see the God who could have come down from the cross if he wanted to. They mocked him. They said, save yourself. Show that you're God. He could have done that. He refused to exercise his power and come down there. He determined that he would stay there and suffer and die. When you look at that man hanging from the cross, you don't see the mighty Savior who is doing battle with the forces of hell. You don't see the mighty victor who is defeating sin and death and hell. This truth that he was rich, and yet being rich, he became poor, we sing of it in one of our best-known Christmas carols. The words of Charles Wesley, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hailed incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, our God with us. So Jesus has the riches of deity, but he was willing to set aside the honors of heaven, not to constantly use all of his attributes and enter into a state of great humiliation. That brings us to the third question. What then are our riches? What are our riches? By saying to these Christians that Christ had made them rich, Paul is reminding them of the poverty which used to mark their lives. Again, it's important for us to recognize that he's not saying that we were one time financially bankrupt without any money. The apostle is speaking here of our spiritual condition. We were sinners who had repeatedly broken God's law and therefore were guilty and deserve to be condemned and punished eternally. That is a spiritual bankruptcy from which there is no escape except for Christ. 
because of the Lord Jesus entering into a state of humiliation and giving himself to the work of redemption, we have been rescued from our sins and made rich, spiritually rich before God. What are these riches that we have been given? Well, we have been made in Christ the children of God. The Apostle John puts it this way in 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. What an amazing truth that we were rebels, we were lawbreakers, we were bound for hell, and God came along and rescued us, and through Christ's redemption, He's made us to be the children of God, people who have a Father in heaven who cares for them. The Bible tells us that we've been, partake, been made partakers of the divine nature. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1 says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now Peter is not telling us that we've been made like little gods, that we've been made divine. But rather, he's telling us, we have known the work of God in our hearts. We know this ongoing work of God to make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. These are part of the riches that we enjoy. Peter also, in his first letter, chapter 1, speaks of an eternal inheritance that we have been given. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There are spiritual riches that are awaiting us in heaven. And when we get there, and experience all of the abundance of salvation that God has planned for us, we will be people rich than we could ever have imagined. As Paul says in writing to the Ephesians, we've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ. And as he writes to the Corinthian church, we have been given such blessedness and there's such blessedness coming in the future that we can't even begin to dream of how great it will be. Every Christian is incredibly rich. It may not be in the things of this world, you may not be able to count it up in your bank account, but in the things that really matter, in the forgiveness of sins, in the transformation of our lives, in the promise of eternal life, we are truly rich towards God. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he was willing to do for his people. Paul tells us here that he did it for your sake. He came on our behalf. He became our substitute. Paul emphasizes that truth here. This isn't just a beautiful example of self-sacrifice. This was that the Lord Jesus might shower grace upon us, that we would be overwhelmed with his love, that he would rescue us from our sins and give us a place in the midst of God's people. And so, what are the riches of Christ? Well, they're his deity. The fact that the glory of God radiates out from him because he is truly God. What is the poverty of Christ? It's his willingness to step behind a human veil, so to speak. 
and to hide for a time those characteristics of his godhood and appear to look just like a man and live like a man in this world that he might suffer and die. Those are his the, uh, things that pertain to his poverty. And our riches, all of the blessings that we get from the Lord Jesus as a result because of his suffering and death. So, two final short questions. Have you recognized your poverty? Have you recognized your poverty? Have you seen yourself as a sinner? And one because of your sin who deserves God's judgment and the penalty of eternity in heaven? Have you seen your own poverty? And if you've seen that poverty, have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ for true riches? Have you cried out to the Savior, asking him to give you what he accomplished, what he finished when he came here to do his Father's will? And Jesus tells us clearly in the gospel, Anyone who comes to me, I won't turn away. What a gracious invitation. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter how we've sinned. It doesn't matter what our past life has been. If we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, asking him to save us, he's willing to receive us and do in our lives what we desperately need. And then we'll be and those are riches that will never rust. They'll never be lost. You know, if the stock market falls or the bank crashes, <coughs> those are an eternal inheritance that we will enjoy in the presence of God forever. So let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness to us that we would be people who know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've heard the gospel preached in our ears and by your spirit you have brought us to believe that and we've experienced your grace in our lives. We, we know this love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that though you were rich, you were willing to take such poverty upon yourself, such humiliation, that we might be rich. Thank you for this incredible generosity. May we live in light of it. May it motivate us in all of our duties as Christians whether it's giving or any other responsibility that you set before us. May we give our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even this morning as we come to this table, may it be with a delight to remember our Lord Jesus and all that he has done for us. We pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen.